On the 2nd of August 1934, the German Chancellor, Adolf Hitler, assumed the title of Führer, literally, leader. The armed forces had to swear a new oath of allegiance to him. To break it was to betray the fatherland. It was a historic moment, though few people at the time realized what was to come. Every German knew the Versailles Diktat, the peace terms imposed by the victorious Allies after the First World War. In March 1935, Hitler broke the Treaty of Versailles by rearming. Within two years, the German army was trebled in strength, the navy rearmed, and the German air force, the Luftwaffe, got squadrons of new planes, as the rest of the world looked on. I remember my family and I going to the cinema and seeing these documentaries and they showed rallies at Munich and marching columns, seemingly endless marching columns of German troops doing, you know, rather sinister goose step and miles of tanks um, being shown and I remember normally we would come out of a cinema having seen Fred and Ginger <laughs> Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and we'd be singing the songs all the way home, you know. But this, we were very quiet going home after these. It was very terrifying. Hitler had been preparing for five years. He'd built his autobahns for his tanks. He'd built the Beetle, so they could be commandeered for war service. It was all part of his plan. We were told the Germans had got cardboard tanks. <laughs> None of us believe that. Hitler was a powerful orator. His speeches fired up countless Nazi supporters, and even people who didn't share his passionate beliefs. I was in the press gallery, a French friend of mine had got me in there. And I don't speak much German, I understand a certain amount, but you know this, uh, you had to hold yourself down when the whole rock rose to their feet and kept on giving this triple Sieg Heil. I can see my press friends also holding themselves down in their chairs. <laughs> in the years before the war, I used to barely lead my parents uh, around Germany in order to help with my German. And then I remember one occasion, I think it was in the Black Forest, I came across a Hitler youth camp. And I was at once accosted by a blonde German lad uh, dressed in his Hitler youth movement uh, uniform and uh, he found that I could talk a little German and so um, he showed me around his camp and it was an absolutely lovely camp, spotlessly clean, very well organized and so on. And the thing that struck me then was that this young man, he was my, I suppose, 17, 18, um, he kept on telling me what they were doing in the Hitler Youth. Weil der Führer sagt, because the Führer says, this was a light motif throughout the whole of his talk. And I thought, my God, why didn't he tell me what he thinks rather than what der Führer thinks? Having rearmed, Hitler's next step was to begin his planned expansion of Germany. The long-disputed territory of the Rhineland was given to France at the end of the First World War. But 17 years later, in 1936, the German army swarmed across the border, meeting little resistance from the native population. The rest of the world turned a blind eye. The 1936 Olympics were held in Berlin. German athletes were required to show Aryan superiority by winning. Ingeborg Zelta was a local schoolgirl. That was the most wonderful experience of my school days. I was just 16 and I'd just finished my exams. From each year, they selected 20 girls who had a certain talent for dance and gymnastics. 
and we perform the Olympic round dance for the opening of the Olympic Games. Jesse Owens, the black sprinter, won everything and one could sense that the Germans disapproved the, the Germans, that's putting it too far, the Nazis disapproved of that and didn't really know how to handle it. Two years later, in March 1938, Hitler sent the German army into Austria, where they received a joyful welcome from Nazi sympathizers. Celebrations in Vienna provided another occasion for Nazi pageantry. Anatole von der Paulen was one of the young German soldiers in the procession. You think of not dropping the gun, you think of keeping his step, especially when you're doing the goose step, and you're thinking of a pain in your foot that you put, to put it down and everything. You, you don't... You're just part of uh, a moving thing, and you're thinking that one thing you try to do is not move in the wrong direction. Britain and France merely issued token protests at the Union of Germany and Austria, which was all the encouragement that Hitler needed. On the 12th of September 1938, he sent troops to the German border with Czechoslovakia, the predominantly German-speaking Sudetenland. Unprepared for war and with unmodernized military forces, Britain's Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, initiated negotiations in Munich with Germany, Italy and France. The four countries agreed to the German occupation of the Sudetenland in a last-ditch attempt to avoid war. When Chamberlain went to uh, Munich to meet Hitler in 38, um, we were all more or less certain that war was coming, if not inevitable. They showed it time and time again of him holding up this piece of paper and he says, we have peace in our time and all these <coughs> psychophants round about him were all cheering, you know, what a wonderful chap he was, you know. He walked to the bottom of the stairs in number 10 and said, I should never have said that. On the 1st of September 1939, just one year after Chamberlain announced peace in our time, Hitler took the fateful step of invading Poland. Britain promptly issued an ultimatum. Germany must withdraw from Poland, or Britain and Germany would be at war. We thought that in Poland it would be over in a few weeks, and that everything would be over for Christmas 1939. We didn't believe that England and France would join the war. We thought it was a bluff, just pressure. When the war started in Poland, the submarines, the ocean-going submarines, were sent already to the Atlantic. We were clear for operation on the west side of England. Two days later, on the 3rd of September 1939, the British public were expecting an announcement from the Prime Minister. We were all waiting to be told by Chamberlain that we were at war because Hitler had not answered his ultimatum and stopped his attack on Poland. They couldn't send a troop of soldiers to the seaside at that time, never mind send them all the way over to Poland. Douglas Dodds Parker was in the House of Commons. I was there when Chamberlain got up and said, I told the Germans that they must stop, and if they don't, we'll be at war as at 11 o'clock. It was quite quietly dramatic, 11 o'clock struck, and no news from 